Hey everyone, it's Joe Nazeas here from The Automator. And in this example here, we're gonna walk you through just how easy it is to add coloring, you know, syntax highlighting to an edit box. And what's really cool is if you stick around, we're gonna show you some great tips that'll make it easier for you to update your code, both for you later on and also for other people, which is the example we actually had come up. So yeah. uh, let's jump into it here. Exactly. Uh, so basically, um, Creating a Scintilla control, uh, I don't know if you remember, I created a, a long time ago, very long time ago, a Scintilla wrapper for, you know, auto hot. a little there? Yeah, I will I'll make it a little bit bigger. Hold on just one second. Oh, didn't want to work. Okay. So I had for a long time a, um, a Scintilla uh, example. It's kind of like a library that I created a long time ago, and it just helps you out creating a little bit of, uh, uh, to add the Scintilla control to an auto hotkey program. And I used it in one of my programs that I created a long time ago as well. Now uh, you were asking, well, how, how difficult it is. And I said, no, it's really simple. It's not that difficult. The, the, the difficult part comes with adding the syntax highlighter itself. But the Scintilla control comes with already some highlighters. The only thing that you have to do with them is setting up the keywords that you want to highlight and the, the, um, um, the colors that you want for those words. That's, that's the difficult part because it's kind of like a little bit of man manual work. I will show you what it looks like. But um, in general, right now, I want you to forget about line one for now. I will explain that in a second. The only thing that you need is the Scintilla wrapper um, SCI um, uh, the HK, which is uh, something that I, we will link to. It is just a, a normal library that you include. That's it. You include your library. Now that you include it, you have access to an object. It is a Scintilla object. Now you're going to load it with the new command, right? And this is where it gets a little bit uh, different than what you're used to. Here on line seven and eight, you see normal adding controls, right? You, you just added a, two controls, one below the other. Um, if we show that, you are used to those two things, right? They're one of, below the other. Now, when you add a Scintilla controller, it does not work like adding a normal control. The way how I set it up is that you just have to specify the handle of the window where you want to embed it. So the handle, you could get it by using the winexist command. So you create your GUI and make it a last found and use the winexist to get the handle. Now that you have a handle, you can put it in your control and then you specify the position and size as you normally would in an in a, um, auto hotkey command, like the X, Y, width, and height. The only problem here is that the Scintilla control is not aware of the previous controls. So <clears throat> my Y position, I have to put it manually. Notice that here I didn't specify a y, a y position, but Auto Hotkey knew how to put it below the next one, right? But for my control, I cannot do that. I have to actually specify what, where the next uh, position, where, where I want to locate it. I put it in 60, my width, height, and just by that, and as soon as you show it, now you have an object here. This SCI is now an object that I will use to control the Scintilla edit box. And I will show below what we're gonna do with it. But when you show the GUI, it is already embedded in it. So when I show it, now I have three controls. Uh, I have the normal edit boxes up here, and this below is the Scintilla controller that is already you know, set up. Now, again, this works as a normal edit box, unless you <clears throat> use some of the options that the Scintilla controller has available. And that's what I'm going to show in a second. So <clears throat> you were telling me, is it difficult? No, it's not. Um, actually, there's a few functions that you can use, like this one here. One of them is setting the wrap mode and setting the lexer. Now you're noticing that I'm using some keywords there. Those keywords come pre-installed with the Scintilla wrapper that I created. You will have a lot of variables that you can just refer to them by name, but they mean something else. In this case, if I want Alexa, 
uh, you know, I want the SQL lexer instead of putting the number seven, that makes no sense that nobody knows what that means, right? I could put this word instead, right? And now you know that I'm setting the lexer to the SQL lexer. You know, it makes a little bit more sense. So that's yeah, what I'm doing. You could have put a, a seven there. Yeah, you can put a seven right there. You can just put a seven in there and it, it is going to work just Next fine. Time through, you're like, wait, what am I yeah. using? Which, I which lexer seven. is that? And, and this set rat word yeah. is number two. You can, you can change all those words and you will see a few more down there to their actual values, which is a number but it will make it really hard to follow what I'm going to show you. So yeah, I'm just using also, it. you know, one might think, hey, but you're defining a lot of variables that I don't use. That's just using more memory. True. However, the memory, you know, usage is so tiny, it's ridiculous. You don't even notice yeah, that it's exactly. there. And you can set up thousands and thousands of those variables and nothing is going to happen. The, the only one downside to that is just that they're global variables. And when you are actually, and this is a good example of why not to use global variables, is that when you do this, um, your global space now has a lot of variables. You see them there? Right. right. right? They're there. If you're debugging, finding a global variable is going to be a problem for you. But if you code correctly, you are not going to use local variables. And when you are inside a function here where it says local, only your variables are going to show up in there. So that's why it is not a good idea to use you yourself, use global variables. But yeah. libraries, like because libraries like this, set up a bunch of variables that allow you to make your code a little bit cleaner. But here's the thing. Notice that, let, let's just go ahead and comment that out, run it. And you notice that down here, I have this, uh, this bar. And what that means is that right now, if I keep typing, it would just scroll to the right. But now, just by using the uh, set wrap mode function, notice that I'm now using my object. So now I know that I'm controlling this object. The cool thing about objects is that now I can have two of them. I can have a second one here. And I could have one of them wrap right. and the other one doesn't. And, and, and now in my code, I will be referring to one object or the other. And I always know which one I'm referring to, you know? So that's the cool thing about objects. But right now, let's just set up the wrap mode. I'm just sending the lexer to HTML. And that's where the work comes into place now. The first thing that I would do is set up what is called the, the style default. So this default is a style that you can set up basic um, font information. Like you, you want the font to be Courier New, you want the size to be 10, uh, and you want the color to be a specific color. And when you do this style clear all, it's it copies it to all the other styles automatically. So that is just the default style is just a way for you to copy the styling for all the others. And you will see that down here, I'm actually setting other styles but I don't want to be setting each of them to the courier new and the size 10. I just do this once. And now all of them are going to be courier new size 10. Now what I'm just going to do, let's go ahead and move them up. Is that for each of the styles, I will set up different uh, um, variables. Like for example, the tags here, whenever you create a tag, I want to set a specific color for it. And let's check on the differences between them. So when I run it, notice that now my background is black, right? The reason for that is because here on my style, my default style, I set it to a dark color. And I just made the whole... This is something that sometimes we want that. Now notice that I couldn't see the, car the carrot. So I'm going to bring this one up. And what this is going to do is that it's going to make my carrot now white so that whenever I'm there, you see the carrot now is white, the little bar is white. So again, I just changed the color of the carrot because otherwise I wouldn't have seen it. So as you can see, I have many functions that I can just call, but the main idea, set your default style first, copy it to all of them by using the style clear all that actually copies the, the default to all of them and now go style by style and use it how you want. Let's let's add a tag, HTML. So let's HTML tag. White. 
Right. So let me let me just show right now that nothing is happening, right? I do have a tag in there, right? I do have a tag in there, but nothing is happening. But now if I set up my tag, I'm setting my H tag to that color. Now this is where the second file comes in. This Silexer H that I created is because my Lexer, my my library does not have the style names for all the languages, okay? I just had the, the basic uh, variables that you need, but for different languages, I didn't do that for each of them. So I just created a different file that just contains that, and I can share it because it's not a big deal. It's not like a, it's not something different. Again, it's just a bunch of variables that contain numbers, right? So, I, now I can refer to this one, which is an HTML tag by its name, and I can assign a color to it and make it bold. Set sty style set bold would make it bold. I have to specify which style I'm referring to and if it is true or false. Now, when I run it again, notice that when I finish my tag, now it goes ahead and highlights it blue. Now, this is the tricky part. I'm relying I am relying on a specific section that the scintilla component already has a lexer for HTML. Now the lexer goes ahead and checks whether it should lex that it should colorize it or not. And when I finish adding my second tag the lexer notifies Scintilla and says, go ahead and color it, right? So the lexer is doing a specific work. Not all the languages have lexers. For example, the Scintilla does not have a language for auto hot. It doesn't have a lexer for auto hotkey. I had to build my own actually a long time ago. I, I built one for auto hotkey because Scintilla didn't have one. Um, but, but if you have a lexer and the default Scintilla has a lot of lexers for SQL, HTML, JavaScript, C, C++, like very common languages. Yeah, I have over 80 for site. For, right, yeah. exactly. You have a lot of languages available. Um, and so, so if you pick one of those, you can just go ahead and set colors for different uh, uh, sec sections. So if you use uh, an unknown tag, that means when you are not finished writing a tag, it will color it. I don't know if you noticed that whenever I'm, for example, uh, typing um, something HTML, it is not colored as nothing right now. But if I set up this color here, now whenever I try with that, it starts coloring it red because it's not known. Now, as soon as I finish, then it goes ahead and finish up time. So again, now I have full control, and this is where the little bit of work comes into place because um, when I was doing the original code, notice how many tags I would have to color just for HTML because HTML is not a simple language. HTML, you can have JavaScript embedded, you can have PHP embedded. So it allows you to code many things inside HTML. That's a little bit of work, and, I, and and this is my method. I just colored the one that, that I care about. The other ones, I leave it commented. If there's one that I need to comment, uh, that I need to put a color later on, then I just go ahead and do that, right? But in our case, I just had the, the basic ones. I have a few um, colors on it, and you will notice that some of them, I actually converted to bold. So for tags, I want to bold them. For attributes, I want to go ahead and um, bold them if it is unknown and those kind of things. So basically, now that I have this, we could just copy paste any type of HTML on it and I should have a few, a little bit of coloring at least. So let me go ahead and, and see because I think I have some HTML lying around. I think I have some, um, I have it in one of my GUIs. Um, Okay, so I just found this. Um, I, I have a little bit of HTML here. So what I'm gonna do, first of all, let me save this and run it. And now let's go ahead and paste this real quick. Let's, let's see what happens. If I go ahead and paste it, well, you will notice actually, that- What's awesome is, a, sorry, let me interrupt you just for a moment. Yeah. 
behind you is yeah. exactly why one of the reasons why we were creating. We started, we, we, we started doing this. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to edit my emails in right. video, and it's really hard to see what you're doing. And right. Look at it pop, right? That's right. awesome. Exactly. So in this case, I'm right now, one of the issues that is going on is that there's some double quotes around. So let me go ahead and fix that real quick. Let me just go ahead and do this. Grab any double quote and replace it with a single quote. That should take care of it. Now let's go ahead and paste it. And now you would have some basic coloring. Whatever is normal text is going to be white. You know, uh, classes are going to be green, yellow for the text. Um, entities, those are entities, uh -huh. are yellow. Uh, and if, or, if you weren't happy with this stuff, you could easily go change it, right? Right, of course. If I don't like one, one specific color, then I just go ahead and change the color of that. Here's the other really, really important thing that you may or may not realize. And um, First off, by the way, the, the link over my head here is to our objects course. So if you're not used yeah. to using the classes, um, it's a great one to help you learn that. But we also have one on GUIs. So if you swap out the objects and put in GUIs, our intro to GUIs course also would be a really good one if you're not familiar with GUIs. Now, auto hotkey in coloring text in your docking, in your GUI, you can do it. However, it's pretty taxing on, you know, the system, right? And it is really complicated to do. <laughs> yeah. And especially if you want it to be like uh, live, like if you're right. typing something right. and that it changes colors yeah. while you type, yeah, that's really complicated. You know, I'm really glad you said that because when I was talking to Maestri with, with this about seven years ago, he was talking about how he was using Studio and why, even though AutoHotKey is written in, in I'm sorry, HK Studio is written in AutoHotKey, um, he uses this scintilla control. And he was right. saying, because he started down that path to try to use AutoHotKey to do it, but he's like, it just, it, it's <laughs> up too much. You know, trying to update as you type, it's crazy. Right, now look at that. So you have the, 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 the code, your code, needs to be aware of what is in the control every time you type something, because notice that it is red, right? But as soon as I type the uh, caret, it goes to blue. But if I type something else that it was not a caret, it doesn't go to blue. Well, so he, right. he, he has to be aware of when right. to put the blue And, and I would say more, even, even more to the point, if you had text after that, right what you're doing and imagine trying to control for that of like you're checking not only where you are here but to the right is there something here and doing all that Woo. that is that is the job of something called alexa and people um have spent a lot of time figuring out how to do lexing in a meaningful way and in a very efficient Optimized. way yeah. that right. was during the call today, when Tom mentioned he was building his own IDE, which I'm like, that's awesome. But I, I said, you know, the reason why my understanding is people use the scintilla control. And is it Lua, the scripting language it's used that's actually doing the work? Or um, I couldn't remember on that. Do you remember LUA? No? Not exactly. They do have some Lua components, but I think the lexing is done different, separately in a different um, in a different DLL. And that okay. is C++ completely, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, anyway, um, but what I was saying was, I said, it's to me, it's kind of the equivalent is, this is why you use regex for parsing your text, right? Because it's been optimized for doing just exactly that. that. Like, exactly no that. Exactly that. Right. Now, now, here's the thing. Now that you have this available, and you know that, again, it is not extremely difficult, Okay. It is a little bit difficult to get your head around it the first time, right? What is difficult and is really hard to do is creating a lexer from scratch. That is difficult. If you just go ahead and use the set lexer and use one of the built-in ones, you're good to go. You don't have to do the work. They already did it. If you want to create your own, which is what I did, uh, it, it was. It, it is a nightmare. Because even if I have kind of like, and this is, and I created it for this program, right? Even if you have one, there's a lot of different situations when the lexer breaks. So for example, if you're just typing something like a uh, message box, this dot is true. Notice that there is color there that shouldn't be there because I'm inside a string, for example. The problem is, that I, for example, not take into consideration, I, I do kind of like modify this if it is an object, like if it is an object, it gives you coloring right next to the variable or something like that. 
but it does it all the time. Not It doesn't check on the context. Well, right now I'm in a string. That shouldn't color there. So, so you, you will find so many little details that you didn't think of that are going to make your head like spin. And yeah. I'm talking about spinning. There was one thing that happened to me. Like I was, oh, I forgot how to set the, the color for the car the, for the right. carrot. Yep. Um, if you don't do that, the, the the carrot gets lost here, and you're typing, but you don't know where the carrot is, and that's not not a good situation for you, right? And I was like, hey, uh, I know that Maestrith has worked on that, right? Let me go ahead and take a look at his code, so I can borrow from it, right? Now, when I took a look at his code, I found this. This is what is happening. Now, notice. And I know this section right here is the one that, I, that does the job because I noticed that there is the background there. And I said, yeah, this is it. I know that he's using it here. So he's setting the background color here. Now, notice that this one is twi this 2052 and this 2051. What is the difference between those two? You don't know. Oh, yeah, I'm going to tell you. When you go to the, to the <laughs> library itself, what happens is that each function is actually a, a message, mm -hmm. the message. So each function has a number. So the style set background is 2052 and 51 is set foreground. Instead of he putting the name, he just used the number, which my, my library allows you to do. Okay, that's one thing. But notice the 32 here. That 32 is actually a style. So you have to figure out what the style is. So right. now I got his code, but I definitely couldn't use it at all because I, I, I couldn't just go one by one. Okay, what does this one do? What does this one do? Uh, what is this one? You know, like, uh, right. I, I actually went back to the documentation and read in the documentation how I could do it. Now, even though this is extremely efficient, it doesn't make any difference. For this code and, and, and this code, they are both going to perform exactly the same. They're, in the eyes of the computer, it's the same thing. When you write code, you write code for humans. Other humans and yourself, you're going to read this wow. later on. <laughs> right. Well, what I was gonna say is, is the the exception would be if you were actually trying to obfuscate it so people could. Yeah, if, if if people if you don't want people to know what it is, go ahead and do whatever you want. That's okay. But in many cases, you write a script and later on, three months later, you have to update it or you have to change something and you have to do something. He's not gonna remember what 26, 20, 2601 is gonna mean by that time. So whatever that function does. I have no clue. He has no clue. Nobody will have a clue. And uh, I, it is difficult to modify this type of code. Do this mostly if you're working for yourself, uh, uh, sorry, for, for teams, because that way somebody else at any right. point, right? one year from now, somebody looks at my code and he's going to say, oh, I need to change the tag, the, the, the color of the numbers because I don't like them red. Oh, look at the numbers here. Oh, look, it says red right there. Oh, no, I want them blue. Uh, then just put blue and that's it. You know, because I know what to look for. Um, so it is good practice, not only for other people, but for yourself, for when you have to modify code later on, to write code that is a little bit readable. And if that means creating a file that contains thousands of variables with numbers in it, so that you don't have to use the number here, I rather do that. <laughs> you know, like I rather have that. Jose, so if you go back to his version with the numbers, right? What I was thinking about was, in in for you, this will be a little better because you speak multiple languages, right? Mm -hmm. um, one is your main language you probably think in, and and I, if I had to guess, you actually now think in English also, right? It's right, yeah. But even if someone could remember what twenty six oh one means, right, they would have to. It wouldn't be in my uh, simulation here, the, the, the you know, comparison. You'd have to remember what it is and then move forward, right? You're not thinking it. If the word's there, it's like in your native language. Yes. You're not reading it and having to remember what it means and then process. It's right. intuitive to you, right? It makes now, sense. Now, now, and I could, I could definitely um, show you an example of that right here. 
what do you think this line does? It is a scintilla controller. We know yeah, that it's, it's, it's getting the text. The length and now look at that. For getting the text, it's getting the length right. of the scintilla controller plus one. Right. And the only thing that I wouldn't understand is what is that? Right. But then I later on see that after you have it, I'm using it. Oh, so whatever I'm getting from here is being set on that variable. Gotcha. Very likely because I'm going to be using it down there. Right. Wow. So, so even though I have no idea about the control, I could infer some things um, by reading it. Now, if you have that as 20, 20, you know, 20, 22, 35, right. and yeah, 21, 11, 22, like nobody's going to know what the heck. Right. Well, the happening. point is, yeah, now <laughs> humans are going to take quite a while to, pro even if you have a good memory, right, you're going to have to kind of refer to computers, to your point, they, it, they it doesn't care. matter. No, so the computer, it doesn't matter. And, and all of this is going to be converted back to zeros and ones. So it doesn't matter. Now, and, and I was surprised because this 32 right here, I remember when I looked at it, I said like, oh, that should be the default style. My mind said like that 32 has to be the default style because I remember from when I was creating the thing that 32 was the, the default style. But after that, none of the other parts, I had any idea what they meant. So I left them just like that. And I said like, no, I will go back to my documentation and <laughs> they will explain me what to do. I, I, I cannot figure it out with that. So that would be my, my recommendation for today. And just a simple example, you know, a few lines of code and you already have a fully working <laughs> Scintilla controller with Lexing for HTML or one or of the 80 something languages. Yeah, they What's really cool about this also is today we were talking about how pe some people get upset of not liking the auto hotkey GUIs. And it's like, you know, you can bring in stuff like this because they think they look old, right? And they do, right? The, the, a lot of the stuff look like XP yes. kind of GUIs. But here's a way to easy way to jazz it up, right? right. And, 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 and you can, instead of using the normal controls, you can just add new scintilla controllers for many other things and just color it up and make it react to different types of I could use one of those as a status bar at the bottom of one of my scripts. You know the status bar that you can use in our hotkey for like, for example, down here? Yeah. Instead of that, I could just put a scintilla controller there and it would be colored. So cool. the hot hotkeys would be one color, hot strings another color. I could definitely do that very easily. So. Uh, I I think if you don't want to make your your thing look a little bit older, yeah, you can. You have a lot of options available, and this is just one more of those. So yeah, just take a look awesome. at it, play a little bit about, and yeah. Let us know if you have any questions. Please like the video if this helped you, if you found it interesting, and because of course we use by you know people like it or comment in the video, we use that as a guide to make more videos. So yeah. really, uh, cheers. Thank you. Bye.